call the December 2021 USD 350 Board of Education meeting to order. Welcome visitors. Any additions or changes to the agenda? Uh, the only one is our uh, auditors. They're tied up. Um, <clears throat> since we moved the meeting back to 7, they're tied up in Maxville doing their audit report. So we'll just throw them on the agenda whenever they get here. Okay. So we're going to do anything formal. Mr. Mr. President, I move the board approve the agenda as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the board approve the agenda as presented. <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Consent agenda. I have nothing to add. For a report from the consent agenda. Mr. President, the board approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the board approve the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Patron comments. Um, Anything not related to COVID policies? Nope. All right. Business items. Uh, we'll skip the financial audit until the auditors come. COVID protocol. <clears throat> uh, I know we have a, several folks here wanting to speak their minds. Uh, I'll just address the board and, uh, and everybody here uh, watching on the video. With our current situation, um, you know, right now, if we have a situation where somebody has been exposed to COVID, uh, our rule is, with medical guidance, uh, within six feet of someone for 10 minutes. So if they're within six feet of someone for 10 minutes, they're identified as a close contact. Uh, there's other situations that could happen, boyfriend and girlfriend or smooching, but it's less than 10 minutes, that's obviously being exposed to the virus. Um, so as far as here at school, our period of time is exclusion from school for 10 days. As long as there's no symptoms, uh, they can come back to school on day 10. Um, we do have the option for students to take a test every day, and if they're negative, they can come to school. Uh, that's been working very well. Uh, to keep kids in school and not at home all the time. Um, uh, the county rules, we, we don't have anything to do with quarantining students. We have no authority to tell students they have to stay at home or anybody in their family has to stay at home. Uh, our only authority is here at school. They can be at school, whether it's a kid or a staff member, uh, whether they can be here or not. Um, our testing program has kept lots of kids in school. I um, understand some are hesitant to do that. Um, if I own my own business and my kid tests positive and now I'm quarantined because my kid is positive, that's a hardship on my family. Um, I can see that uh, hesitance from some. Um, and we've had several not, not do the testing uh, for that, that reason or other reasons. Uh, a particularly difficult situation is when we have a household contact. If, uh, I live in the household that there's a positive case. I'm going home to that positive case that has COVID, active virus, uh, every day. Um, we can, there's no test to come to school in that case. So that's 10 days for that person to be cleared, and then I have to be excluded for another 10 days. So that becomes particularly difficult when we have a sibling um, or family member that is a positive case. Um, our mask situation, we have that 6% threshold. If we have a lot of active cases and quarantines uh, above 6%, we have the mask required for two weeks. We've offered the option for families to opt out of that. Um, so with all of this, we've been doing our best. Um, you know, we have 400 people in one location. Uh, that's different than my friend's business that has 30 people in a, in a building twice the size of this, they can spread out. We cannot spread out in the classroom very well. So uh, our situation is a little bit different than uh, your situation might be at your workplace or in your home. Um, so it makes it particularly difficult here. Um, our goal has always been two things, 
keep everybody safe, and keep kids in school. That's, that's been our goal all along. Um, people have been great with this. Um, I guess one rule I've always, always had as a school administrator is if I'm making people mad on this side and the people on the other side are also mad, then I'm probably making the right decision. Now that's kind of tongue in cheek, but this is one of those situations where there's no one right answer. Um, so whatever we do, somebody's upset. Um, and it is important that we're safe and we are on the side of caution because um, this is dangerous for, for folks. Um, but I also think we cannot ignore, and we, we have not been ignoring the fact that keeping kids out of school is a bad thing. Um, there's times we have to do that. If I know somebody's been exposed to the virus and very well likely may have it, letting that person come into the classroom is not smart. Um, but keeping kids at home is also a negative um, that we can't ignore. Um, and we need to protect our, our staff and other students. So our best, we, we've done our best to follow the guidelines. Um, we've got guidelines from CDC, from KDHE, from County Health. Um, all of those guidelines, especially the ones with our state and nation, are, are one size fits all. Uh, for a high school in New York City or an elementary school in St. John, the guidance is the same. So. I think we've done a pretty good job along the way tweaking that guidance to, to fit our local situation. An example is all of the medical guidance says wear masks 100% of the time. Uh, we don't feel we need to do that 100% of the time. We've made the decision uh, to only do that when we have to. Bottom line is we have to get back to normal. Um, that's what we've talked about as a staff and what is normal. And no masks and no quarantines will feel pretty normal. We don't have to worry about that at all. Um, uh, the virus may be here for another year or two or five years, I don't know. But once we can get to that point where we're not keeping kids out of school, uh, keeping kids at home, it'll feel pretty normal. Um, so taking steps to get there, I think, is important. Um, uh, Aaron and I had a good conversation on the phone the other day. Uh, I'm not going to say all of his words. I'll let him speak. I'll let you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, bottom line, he's frustrated that his family's been in a situation where his kids have been kept at home. He's not the only one. Uh, there's been a lot of situations um, where we've had to keep kids at home. And we don't want to do that. Uh, we don't want that situation, but we do have people we need to protect and we can't let that explode uh, in our school and have to shut down. Um, so we've had good conversations um, about, uh, about the situation. Um, and we can agree to disagree. I've had multiple conversations with other people. Uh, so I think we've done a good job of being able to communicate express our concerns but not attack or uh, accuse somebody of wrongdoing or anything immoral or illegal or anything crazy like that. Um, so um, we all have the same goal in mind. Uh, we want kids in school. We want everybody safe. Um, we have guidelines to follow and uh, so I guess I would like to turn it over to Aaron. I know a lot of us had the same concern, uh, so it'd be good if Aaron could speak to that. Um, we don't need to hear from, you know, the board has business to do. We don't need to hear the same thing over and over. So if you guys support what he says. Uh, uh, so Aaron, I guess uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you. The board has seen uh, the letter. Right. So Yeah, I don't plan on reading that. I figured okay. it circulated well enough. That everybody sure. had a chance to see that. And yep. I've talked to most of you guys. Um, I mean, I appreciate you guys doing everything that you did, that you have done to keep the kids in school and putting their safety as a top priority. Um, you guys have all been transparent, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I guess for me and for uh, 26 other families that represent 70 students in the school, um, 
it's frustrating, obviously, to us. I mean, especially maybe it's different for me, the fact that I have three kids in elementary school, and two of which are in three-year and four-year preschool. So I have one in the morning, one in the afternoon. You know, if they're quarantined, then, I mean, they can't go to daycare then. But, I mean, the testing to stay in school, I mean, that's fine. It's inconvenient. I mean, if there's two kids that are testing every morning, that's fine. It doesn't make you late to work. It doesn't make kids late to class. But if you have 30 kids, you know, that end up having to swab every morning to go to class, and then kids are late to class, we're late. I mean, I work out of town. We're late to work, and then we test for 10 days, and they're negative the whole time, thankfully. So far, we've had that. But I guess... Throughout the whole thing, you know, we've been told to follow the science, follow the science. Well, it seems like the science changes every other week. You know, if we keep following the science, we'll be in the same position when my second grader is a senior in high school, probably. And I don't want them to grow up thinking that it's normal for them to have to wear a mask in school, you know, or that it should be on their conscience that they might inadvertently get somebody at home or at the store or somewhere, you know, sick. Because that's human nature. We're all, everybody's going to get sick. Everybody's going to carry diseases. You're going to spread it to people whether you know it or not. Um, and I know you guys, obviously, like you said, work outside of the, the county or the state, you know, the federal guidelines. But whenever we can have everybody go to a football stadium, have 80,000 people in it, all drinking and screaming and having a grand old time, no masks, no so social distancing, we can go to an interest banker you know, with 20,000 people, do the same thing indoors, you have no clue if the person sitting right next to you for the you know, past three, four hours had COVID, and then you take it back, take it to work, and, and nothing's done about that. I mean, nothing comes on the news to say, hey, if you're in this row, this seat, and you sit by this person, then you need to quarantine. You know, it, it needs to get to the point where the quarantine, the contact tracing, if you have symptoms, then be tested. I mean, we don't do this for influenza, for RSV. RSV hospitalizes 58,000 kids a year. And I mean, we don't contact trace for that or make kids wear masks. I mean, my kids get RSV every year. This year, obviously, because of all the quarantine, the guideline, the mask, RSV came in the summer instead of the winter like usually it does. But there's still a fair share of other you know, colds and apparently influenza back this year, too, I guess, from what I've been told. But I just got a list of things that I put together to off the, directly off of the CDC's website. So none of this is made up by me. I don't, I'm assuming they're accurate. I mean, it's a government document. It should be accurate. <laughs> but <laughs> so as of December 2nd, there have been just over 7 million cases of COVID in children 0 to 17 years old making up 9.5% of the total child population and 17% of all the COVID cases in the country since January of 2020. As of October 10, 2021, there have been 1.9 million cases in the 5 to 11 year old age group. 94 COVID deaths were also reported in this age group. The 94 deaths from COVID made up 1.7% of all the deaths among U.S. children in the 5 to 11 age group. I'm not going to, I don't want to try to sound insensitive or that a life doesn't matter because every life matters, but unfortunately we can't save every life. And I mean, that's, that's not our job to do that. And I don't wish that on any parent or anybody to outlive their kids. So the leading causes of death in children 5 to 11 in 2019 were accidents, unintentional accidents, 969, 525 were cancer, 274 from congenital malformation, 207 from homicide, 115 from heart disease, 107 from asthma, 84 from influenza, 66 from suicide, 56 from stroke, and 48 from septicemia. So from October 3rd of 2020 to October 2nd of 2021, there were 66 COVID deaths in the 5 to 11 age group. The same number as the kids who commit suicide. But from, for hospitalizations for kids, 0 to 17, from December 4th, from the beginning of the pandemic to December 4th, there have been 5,034 hospitalizations. And according to the CDC, these rates are similar to the pre-pandemic influenza rates. 
and the severity is also comparable among children hospitalized with influenza and COVID. For March 2020, August 21 to August 2021, there were 562 kids in the 5 to 11 year old age group hospitalized with COVID. 68% of them had other underlying conditions, one or more. The top one being chronic lung disease at 29%, obesity at 25% with a body mass index of 90 in the 95th percentile or greater, and neurological disorders at 23%. So since the beginning of this pandemic, since January of 2020 to December 8th of 2021, there were 757 <coughs> deaths involving COVID, 1,170 deaths involving pneumonia, 176 deaths involving COVID and pneumonia, 189 deaths involving influenza, and 1,827 deaths involving pneumonia, influenza, or COVID. So based off of all those numbers and a population of 74.2 million kids under the age of 18, that's nine thousandths of a percent of all of the COVID cases in children resulted in death. Seven hundredths of a percent of all the child COVID cases resulted in hospitalization and eight ten thousandths percent of the total population of kids under 18 have died of COVID and six hundredths of a percent of the population under 18 have been hospitalized with COVID. So because my main thing is especially right now um, everybody five years up can go get vaccinated. Everybody 16 and up can go get a booster shot. Um, the argument that um, these kids need to mask up and quarantine and whatever else is the argument that they're doing this to protect mom and dad or grandma and grandpa is, I mean, invalidated now. Because anybody can get vaccinated and have eight to ten times more, you know, or less of a chance of developing a severe response to COVID or catching COVID in general. You know, eight times less chance that they get vaccinated. So, I mean, that's on everybody. If you want to get vaccinated, you can get vaccinated. That's uh, that's great. That's your right. You can do that. So, kids don't need, you know, it doesn't make sense for the people who are the least likely to have severe complications from COVID, be hospitalized or die of COVID, are being treated like so much different than people in the higher risk category who are the people who are going out to concerts, who are you know, going to ball games and living their life. Like if it wasn't for the fact that I have three kids in elementary school, I probably, probably wouldn't even know COVID existed still. Because I just, I don't see it really in my everyday life. You can go to Wichita, I mean, it's just complete mayhem. I mean, I'm happy to just stay right here in the middle of nowhere and not see any of the people there. But I guess that's, that's my main thing. And on top of the you know, unnecessary quarantines and wearing masks, um, you know, the, the emotional, the mental um, strain is putting on kids that are having to wear masks now and have to isolate from their friends. Uh, there's another article from the CDC about uh, suicide attempts in kids. And since February of 21 to March of 2021, the suspected suicide attempt emergency department visits were 50.6% higher among girls aged 12 to 17 years than during the same period in 2019. And among boys aged 12 to 17 years, the suspected suicide attempts increased to three point, or increased by 3.7%. Among adolescents 12 to 17 years old, the average weekly number of emergency room visits for suspected suicide attempts were 22.3% higher during summer of 2020 and 39.1% higher during the winter of 2021 than during the corresponding periods in 2019, with a more pronounced increase among females. During winter of 2021, emergency department visits for suspected suicide attempts were 50.6% higher among females compared to the same period in 2019. Some of the researchers have cautioned about a potential increase in suicides during the COVID-19 pandemic on account of increases in suicide risk factors. Young persons might represent a group at high risk because they might, might have been particularly affected by mitigation measures such as physical distancing, including a lack of connectedness to schools, teachers, and peers, barriers to mental health treatment, increases in substance use, 
and anxiety about family health and economic problems. In addition, average emergency department visits rate rates for mental health concerns and suspected child abuse and neglect also increased in 2020 compared with 2019, potentially contributing to increases in suspected suicide attempts. So, I know you guys are doing the, the best that you can with what you have, and you got. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to keep all the kids safe, and I mean, because that's what you were elected to do. So I just wanted to shine my perspective onto it, and just a little bit of facts straight from the fact holders, the CDC, and take that as you will. That's all I've got. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have some suggestions for some potential policy changes. Um, uh, at this point, I would not recommend going completely away from everything, 100%. Uh, um, you know, I guess if we err on the side of caution with our laws and our land, uh, if we make the speed limit 20 miles an hour everywhere, that's going to save a lot of lives. And uh, it's not necessary to do that. Uh, but it's also not necessary to say we're not going to have no speed limit anywhere. Uh, so at this point, following the guidance and uh, taking steps toward normal, uh, I think is important. Um, so some things here you have on your, uh, your uh, supporting documents there. I call your attention to page 28. So the current period of exclusion is 10 days. Um, uh, and again, we talked through that, and they can test daily and come to school. Um, what, this change would fit within KDHE guidelines uh, that they've tweaked a bit, uh, would be returning on day seven. Uh, it's not a huge change, but uh, reducing that to seven, I think, would be an important step toward not, you know, keeping kids out of school for fewer days. Um, now, the student or staff member could choose to test all seven days and be in school, or not do the testing except on day six, test once, and come to school on day seven. Uh, that's one change we could make uh, that would fit with the guidelines. Uh, that would not be a departure from the guidelines. As far as identifying uh, close contacts, um, let me preface this by saying, I guess, why are we looking at changes? Well, we have to get back to normal at some point. Um, We've had a lot of situations, and Aaron asked me this, and I don't have hard data on this, but how many kids do we have? What percentage of kids have we quarantined, or staff and students have we, uh, I, I say quarantine, knowing we're not quarantining them, we're excluding them from school. What percentage of people have we identified as close <coughs> contacts, kept them out of school, and they develop symptoms or test positive? It's very, very low. Uh, we've had situations this fall. We had a big blow up with our, started with our volleyball team. We had several kids test positive, but it was all at once. Um, it had spread, and then we started the testing and, and found it. But once we identified close contacts and they either stayed home or tested to come to school, there was very few cases that popped up. We had a situation with our second grade just within the last month had to identify the close contacts. Um, we're using our six feet for 10 minute rule. Um, we had none of those kids develop symptoms or test positive. Uh, we, I take it back, we had one kid, but it was on the same day. So it wasn't like it spread from that. So I guess I bring that up because we're being very careful about this. We're going 20 miles an hour everywhere. Um, and maybe we can increase that speed limit, is where I'm going with this. Um, if we can quarantine fewer kids that we don't have to quarantine, we're learning as we go, um, we're better off. And again, if we know a situation where everybody could agree we probably don't need that kid spreading the virus around, we need to do that. But, so this would be one step here. Rather than six feet, 
change it to three feet. So if we're within three, meet, three feet for 10 minutes, then you're identified as a close contact. Um, in our experience, I think that would still keep everybody safe, staff and students, um, and keep fewer kids out of school. This is a departure from the guidance. This is not KDHE. Uh, KDHE guidelines do say that in school we should keep kids at least three feet apart. Uh, but their close contact rule is six feet per 10 minutes. So this one again would be a departure from the guidance. Um, if we're wearing masks, we've had situations where kids are wearing masks and uh, we go to lunch and we're not wearing the masks or you're a positive case and I'm wearing a mask but you're not, now I, I'm identified as a close contact. Uh, frustration and misunderstanding with that, um, but if the masks work then we should recognize that. Uh, so if uh, our current policy says that both of us are wearing a mask, there's no quarantine necessary, a change could be that if I'm wearing a mask, I'm not a close contact for anybody. That's a departure from the guidance as well. Um, the time frame that we're doing the testing, Aaron kind of alluded to this about, I have to have my kid there at 745, I've got to be at work at 730. Uh, the kids riding the bus, we don't have those kids that are testing to stay, ride the bus. Uh, you know, we don't want them here at the end of the day, and now we're testing them to see if they're positive, and now they've been here all day. But that is a hardship on folks. So. Uh, allowing parents to drop off their kid at whatever time they need to and kids can ride the bus and they test when they get here or when we're available to test. So it's just a change in uh, um, what time frame we do that. KDHE guidelines say kids should be able to get to school. Uh, it shouldn't be different for those that ride the bus and uh, test daily. It doesn't say when. So this would not be a departure from the guidance um, if somebody has had COVID and tested positive already, uh, our guidance says, or our protocols say, if you've tested positive in the last three months, you don't, you're not a close contact, you're exempt from any of that. Uh, KDHE says six months, I'd recommend changing that to six months. So if I've tested positive for COVID in the last six months and I'm identified as a close contact, I don't need to worry about it. So there's five tweaks to our policy that I think gets us closer to normal and I don't think puts us at any more risk uh, based on our experience. Um, three of those five I think are no-brainers. They fit with the guidance that we have. Two of those are a bit of a departure from the guidance. And again, back to my point about we're already going against the guidance by not requiring masks 100% of the time. So we're already making some of those decisions. Josh? Yes. Do you feel like we can get the kids further than three feet apart? Um, In the average classroom? Or there are really no close contacts? Probably not. No. Maybe half of the classrooms. It's easier in our secondary grades depending on the class. But no. Three feet, yeah, most of the time, three feet is doable, six feet is not. Did you ask three feet or six? Yeah. 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 That, that's, are we, are three we feet, we can get pretty close. Can we like, do away with close contacts by saying three feet? I don't think we can do away with it in not secondary, 100%. but I think we can yeah. get really close to doing away with the close contacts with the three feet. Because that would eliminate a lot of the quarantines. And, and, that's correct. Yeah. And one of the things we want to continue to do, if we can, is to have like, you know, group projects, the best practices for education, and, and we don't want to discourage that necessarily. So that would break that three feet during some of those projects too. So in those cases, we'd still have contact tracing. But it would be a significant reduction, not like 50%, 70%, how much would we need? 50%, I guess. Okay. And again, we're not talking about willy-nilly just making this up, we've been sending kids home that have not ended up testing positive. 
or getting sick. So we've, we've I, I don't want to say unnecessarily, but the guidance we had, we we're doing the best we, we could, but in our experience, we're sending a lot of kids home that in hindsight we didn't need to. My, my caution on the three feet is I just don't want you guys to think that if, if we go to three feet, we've done away with contact tracing completely. You know, there's still going to be some. It's just going to be significantly less. So explain to me again, just so I'm clear, if a student is wearing a mask and they are within three feet, you're not considering them as a close contact, you'd have to go home, right? If, yes, if the board chooses to make that change, yes. That's what I've outlined as one of the potential changes here. What if somebody's had the antibodies since they've already had it, Josh? Are they still singled out as that will count? Um, I don't know how we know if they have the antibodies. Right now, the guidance only says if there's been a positive test. So if I know, if, I, if I've had a positive test in six months, uh, I don't need to worry about any of that. But outside of that, we don't know if somebody's had COVID. Uh, I don't even know if they're doing the antibody testing anymore. Uh, I don't know enough about that. But. There's a couple other uh, options on here um, that I don't recommend at this point. Um, but maybe we end up there at some point. Um, I know there's a, other school districts that have, if they identify close contacts using their six feet, ten minute rule, um, as long as the student or staff does not have symptoms, they just wear a mask and come to school during that ten day period. If they continue to have no symptoms, uh, it's done with. That I can't recommend that that departs too far from the guidance. Um, um, and then another school district, I've seen their policy basically doing all of the things that we're doing as far as the contact tracing, but it's only a recommendation. We say Carl's a close contact, we call the parents. Carl's been a close contact, he can stay home for 10 days, or he can come to school and test every day, or Whatever you guys decide, do whatever you want, come to school. Uh, so there are schools doing different things. Um, I'm not making those recommendations at this time. I just wanted you to see there's other things out there that people are, other school districts are doing. I have no idea how it's going for them. Oh, it's close contact figured right now. I mean, as far as you have know, somebody test positive in the class, how do you actually get who's actual close contact just by the seeing chart. seeing charts and talking with teachers and talk to the kids and test positive. And and honestly, it's not a good process. We have elementary kids that they they go to lunch. We know who they're sitting by at lunch, and then they go to PE. Who are they around the PE? Everybody. Uh, then music and MTSS, they're working with uh, different kids each day. It's, uh, it's not a perfect process by any means, honestly. This also isn't just about the kids. <clears throat> yes. I have concerns with our staff. Have you talked to the staff much on? <clears throat> we discussed it in our staff meeting the other day. Uh, Opinions vary. It's, it's, 
I guess, like our, our community is. So opinions on both sides of things. Um, but I do think it's important that we take steps towards that normal. Um, you know, I, I don't see CDC and KDHE changing a whole lot. The rest of the school year, and that's hard for folks. We don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. We're just going to keep doing this. And if we, if we can take some steps that I don't think are going to put us more at risk, I think that's a better situation than just waiting until the powers that be tell us what to do. Because um, again, their guidance is one size fits all, and we make decisions for our people. How big of a spike did we see after Thanksgiving? Just to get an idea of what maybe after Christmas? It wasn't. Uh, really, our spike was right before Thanksgiving. Really, we didn't see it kind of leveled off. But we have very few cases right now. Um, so, our options, I guess, with changing any policies right now. You can choose to change these now. I've given you uh, five situations or five parts of the protocols we could change. Um, I think with policies, slower is always better. Let people digest any change. Uh, we consider that um, before the next board meeting um, and make a change next board meeting. Uh, whether it's this or something else, or um, where you just table it indefinitely, or you choose to do away with all of it. Um, would you be able to provide, say we pass your changes, would you be able to provide us hard numbers from what it was to what it is that night, the change in quarantine and whatnot, if it gets us headed in the right direction? Uh, that'd be difficult to do just because we're so up and down. It's not, I couldn't say like during this two week period we, we had this many quarantines, and, um, this many positive cases, and then after Christmas, it'd be difficult to quantify. I can give you a good idea, maybe. Uh, but if we, if we chew on this for till the next meeting, really we're talking about two school weeks this week, and then we have Christmas break, and we have one week, and we have our next board meeting. So it's not like it's a huge time frame to. Uh, we have to do something right now. But it's up to you all. Well, I want to try what you suggested. I'm just it sounds like it's better. Than where we are, and, uh, I'd, I'd like to try changing them. And maybe it won't be the answer, but it sounds better than what we got now. I agree. If we, <clears throat> Josh, we try this and our numbers spike, um, would we if above the six percent? Would we go back to mask at that point? Yes, our current protocols say if we're above the six percent, um, we're doing the mask. Is that mandatory for everybody? No, still have the opt out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, will be in there. Yeah. Still not an opt out for staff, however. Correct. Staff can. Where's the, where's the proof on that mask? Where is the proof? Yeah, I think the proof for you all need to be provided. Is this a part of the pilot program? Like, which plan is this? Is this in the pilot program? Especially when you say because departure from the guidance. I'm kind of curious. So you're stepping, me, you're stepping away? As a pilot program, you can't opt out of the testing. It's all a part of the program that you all got into. Yeah. So is this a part of the, like the next phase that you're describing and explaining? Is that something in the pilot program? Or is that just something that you made up or did you get it off of somewhere? Or? 
No, we're, we're trying to take steps towards normal. I think normal is just going back to normal. Yeah. And, and just dropping it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, no matter what, the flu is going to be around. It's just the strain of the flu. It's always going to be here. It's just whether or not you let the fear get to you. We're trying to get to the point of normal um, without straying too far at any one point in time. Um, we have to watch out for the kids. We have to watch out for the community. And unfortunately, in this phase of age, we have to watch liability-wise on the school, too. But biggest thing is keeping the kids in school. I mean, we have to get the kids in school as much as possible. And so we're trying to get to that point. I keep hearing from, um, not just from St. John, but from other schools in, um, in Kansas and out of state, including uh, suburbs from Wichita and Dallas, where I have relatives in school, that the masks work. I understand their pain. I personally have a real difficulty using a mask because of my other breathing issues, but if it works, why are we fighting so hard having the kids wear them? I mean, the kids in my family that live in areas that require them, it's just a matter of fact for them. They get ready to walk out of their, their family home and the masks go in their bags or they go on their places when they go to church, when they have um, class concerts. Um, when they go outside to play, the masks just automatically go on. It's a part of their life that they've adjusted to. The parents don't like it, but their kids, especially the ones in, in Texas, have not missed a single day of school and haven't had to do any modified schooling. And they started wearing masks um, back in, in March of when this first came up. So. I know it's not a popular idea, but it's a proven idea. So um, I don't have any problem with guidelines that keep us following the CDC and KSBE and, and others. I just think that the masks work and we need to keep that as part of our of our process. Can I say something? <clears throat> what about the teachers that have to keep the kids the, have their mask on in class? Like they struggle to, I mean, I struggle with my two and a half year old, five year old, when I take them to the doctor because I have to wear one there. I can't even get them to wear one for 20 minutes because it, they keep pulling it down. So I just don't feel like that is even going to be. Um, any type of a solution because they're not if you're not wearing it over your face completely all the time the whole time what is the point in making them you know half wearing it and then like the whole um, okay well we have people you're okay now to vaccinate from five and up so then why can't you have your kid then vaccinate if you choose to um, or have them wear a mask if you choose to but making I won't let my kid wear a mask I will absolutely not do that I don't think that's fair to them, to the teachers, or having to, I mean, the consequences of wearing one, I just, I, I just, that, that's not gonna work. For me personally, I will not let my kid wear a mask. And I think that is part of the rebuttal, you know, in the, in the family members that I've got, in the
um, because of those things and my choices. But I think if there are some kids that I see um, in our school district who still wear their masks and their parents encourage it. So if it works, why not do it? I think kids wear masks because they're told to do it. That's why they comply because, you know, you tell them that that's their normal that they have to grow up with. But there's a difference between wearing a mask for an hour or two or from 8 o'clock in the morning till 3.20 in the afternoon. That's not okay. Let's see, like, you know, if you guys vote to have masks on for two weeks, why don't all of you board members and the principal, everybody wear a mask for two weeks from 8 to 3 o'clock and you see how you get along with it. Take it off for an hour when you go to recess and take it off for an hour when you go to lunch. You all are about all in the agronomy field, outside working and stuff, how would you like it? And you think about the kids that are in the classroom that have to wear this, like it's not okay. It's psychologically not okay and it has effects on kids for years to come and it has effects on adults. It has effects on everybody and it's not okay what it is doing. Most of your masks that you're using either as an airway right beside because it's the surgical, it is made for droplets, it's what, 95% effective for bacteria. We're fighting a virus. A virus is 0.1 microns. What's the mass do? 0.3 microns. 95% success rate on 0.3 microns. Virus, 0.1. Do the math, please. It's the bacteria when you wear the mask, you're harboring that bacteria up against your face. It cannot leave the mask. But the virus, it secretes out your eyes, out your nose, it's in the air, it's in your fecal matter, for Pete's sakes. It's, it is literally, it, it, it floats. But when, you, when you're trying to protect yourself from a virus and you have a mask on, it's like throwing sand through a chain link fence. It doesn't work. It just, there is so much science and proven facts that masks do not protect somebody from a virus. But what it does is it makes you sick because of the bacteria that it harbors against your face. The pneumonia, the strep, the influenza, and so much of what kids and people get because they are wearing the masks on their face. And it's, it's really sad that information is all out there, but you don't see it because of what people are getting fed through the propaganda and the media. And it, it's, it's really sad. It's sad that kids have to take the effect and they're the ones that get punished for it. Thank you. Um, so I guess our options at this point are we table any changes, or we have a motion to change our current policies? I'll make a motion to change the policy that Josh explained. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that the board approve the changes um, as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion carried. Okay. <clears throat> Calendar adjustment. Thank you all Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Appreciate it. maybe for air conditioning um, we had to cancel abruptly and then we had the week of September 13th where we were out for COVID um, <clears throat> our calendar was set up where we had about five extra days above the minimum so uh, we need to make up one day for sure um, I would recommend at this point for an action item December 20th we have down as a half a work day so it's half of a contract day for teachers 
um, <clears throat> identifying the 20th and 21st as a professional development day. Uh, the idea is that they would have that time on their own, uh, whether they want to work at home or at school, or whether they want to do it on those days or other days, uh, with the idea of being ready for remote learning. Uh, if this thing blows up, we just cannot cancel school again. If it gets really bad and we have to shut down, it needs to be for one day and then we're remote. So they need to be available or ready at the drop of a hat to do remote learning if it gets really bad. I don't want to do that. I don't want to get to that point. We want to keep the doors open. But um, So we get to count those two days as one. That gets us back to zero on the minimum. And then I would recommend, just as a precaution, I guess tentatively planning on adding two days in May. So instead of the 17th being the last day, it would be the 19th for students. Um, I don't recommend taking formal action on that part now just because it may get bad. We may have a bunch of weather we, we're dealing with and we have to make another calendar change. Let's just tentatively plan on that and in April we can go ahead and make that formal. Here's our calendar change, whether we need it or don't need it or need more days. Uh, but then we can get word out to families if this is the consensus of the board that adding two days in May is what we should do as a precaution. We can tell everybody, put that on your calendar, don't leave yet, we're adding two days. So, Any questions about that? Mr. President, I move that the board approve adding two days of professional development on December 20th and 21st. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the board add two days for professional development on December 20th and 21st. All those in favor say aye. 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 Both same sign. Motion carried. Elementary principal. Um, the board directed me to look at how can we add an elementary principal position back into the mix? Um, our staffing numbers, I think I shared some of this with you on a Friday note. Um, so really the, the main changes that we've seen over time, over the past several years, um, we had a preschool teacher. Um, we had two employed by the co-op. They weren't going to fund one. We thought it was important that we kept that, so we had to fund that position. Uh, we added a half counselor with Kim Volker. Uh, she was, we were sharing her with Stafford, and we brought her over. Uh, and then we added an interventionist. That position is paid for with our federal funds. We reduced the principal position, reduced half the Spanish position, or sorry, we. We added half the Spanish position because it was half time and now uh, we're full time. She's doing other things. Um, Angie Webb left. We did not fill that position. Uh, we've added two aides <clears throat> and with our tech and music, uh, those positions over time have added a fraction. Um, Gil Cornwell, when she was here, wasn't full time. Dick Smith was not full time. It's just hard to. Those part-time positions are kind of a unique situation. If we want to hire somebody, pretty much has to be a full-time position. So overall, we've added 3.7 FTE um, over time. Um, there's not a lot of wiggle room to reduce that unless we, for instance, get rid of that three-year-old preschool. I don't recommend doing that. Um, so I don't see a lot of options there as far as reducing. Our cash situation, we've done fairly well uh, since 2014. <clears throat> we need to be around that $550,000 mark. That's our ultimate goal uh, for spendable cash. We're at 510 this last year. Uh, so we're in a decent cash position. Um, one way I know we can afford uh, principal position uh, I think we could work it in the mix with some shuffling, um, but I guess the fallback position would be capital outlay. It's in state law that we can take custodial and maintenance salaries out of capital outlay rather than a general fund. Um, so we could take a few of those positions, pay them out of capital outlay. The bad thing is that probably needs to be a 
short-term fix because we have a lot of capital needs. Um, the capital outlay budget gets a lot easier here in three years because our lease purchase comes up. So I think using that short-term plan uh, is definitely workable. Um, So at this point, I could recommend going ahead and advertising for the position. Um, if the board's not quite comfortable with that yet, I'd recommend we go ahead and open it. And then we're going to take applications. I don't know. I wouldn't get an I wouldn't get applications collected in the interview process before our next board meeting anyway. So it would likely be at our February board meeting at the earliest. So I would recommend going ahead and approving. Opening that position, we'll get to work on finding somebody, and then if we just don't find somebody or we decide it's just not financially feasible, we can uh, pull back and hope for another year. So. I think we need to move in that direction still. I think we've missed out. When you fill out for um, uh, application process, does it have to say that applications are due by, or can you leave it open that applications will be accepted until the position is filled? I usually put an end date, especially on a position like that, just because um, we, we want to end up at a point where <clears throat> we've got these applications and we need to move forward. Sometimes when people see that open until filled, um, then people may hold off on applying. So with the time frame we have, I would probably put an end date on it. Um, I'd like to see us have somebody in that position, but I definitely think if we do have to look at the capital outlay route, that's a short term, very short term fix um, until we can find a way to fit it into the rest of the budget. I agree, that throws up red flag with me and I agree we need a principal but I don't want to rob one just to get the other. <coughs> Mr. President, I move that the board approve the addition of an elementary principal position for the 2022-23 school year. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the board approve the addition of an elementary principal position for the 22-23 school year. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Welcome. Wow. Uh, to the I tell you, that's just pretty good timing. Yeah, I got lucky. <laughs> Sorry, I'm running a little late. Well, I'll explain the situation. So. I'm going to go ahead and let you yeah, take one and pass one around. And then I'll start some on the other side. I tell you, it's a little bit further from Maxwell here than I thought it was. <laughs> I didn't think I was ever going to find that roundabout. <laughs> I thought I was going to end up in Stafford. Aaron apologizes for not being able to be here. He's delivered, and we're delivered. He's delivered too, I'm delivered too, so we're, he's pretty busy too. I'm just going to borrow a corner here by Elisa, if that's okay. Yeah, you said over here. Well, I can do that. I kind of been sitting for all day, okay. so I, if you don't mind, I'll stand up. Uh, I just want to briefly go through the auto report. Same format as last year for those of you board members that were here last year. Uh, no changes, basically which is unusual, because usually, probably, it'll all change next year. You know how that goes, but on page one and two is the opinion. And remember, the your financial statements there. 
you hire us to give an opinion as to whether or not they're in the fairly presented realm of the <coughs> We give you, uh, they're your financial status, we help you draft them in accordance with the Kansas Municipal Accounting and Auditing Guide. But basically, they're your financial statements. So when we look at one and two, this is our opinion on those financial statements. Two things to note is, number one, is that they're not in accordance with general accepted accounting principles or GAAP, but they're not intended to be, because every beginning of every school year, you adopt a waiver from GAAP that allows you to use the regulatory base level as allowed by statute. <clears throat> you do that every year. And so we say in there that they're not in accordance with the generally accepted accounting principles, but they are in, in accordance with the rate for base of accounting, which is the clean up law. They may have a question on that, because it is a little confusing, since it's a dual, dual report. Okay? On page three and four is the financial statement, and this talks about the the shows the be each fund beginning cash receives expenditures and then any cash that any other kind of cash show, column shows compliance with the cash basis law, which basically says that you will not spend or encumber any more funds than you have available unless it's a federal fund. Because federal funds require that you spend it before that you request reimbursement. And I think if you look on there, the only negative is that that's our fund. Yeah. And it, it shows a negative, but that's the way those federal funds work, because you're not allowed to get the money and sit on the money. You're, you have to spend it before you request it. So at the end of the year, a lot of times there's, there's a uh, timing difference between when you spend it or encumber it to be spent and then actually receive the money. So for the, does anybody have any questions on that? For the cash basis report, we show with the negative, but I'll show you where we explain it and that it is not a set toward a violation of the cash base of the law. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions on that? You know that your cash went from 768 up to 875, which is good. Uh, shows an increase, your general fund basically has to zero out each year or come very, very close. So the only reason would be if you happen to have a little bit of mineral production tax carry it from the prior year. Okay? If we look on page, uh, page five starts in this to the financial statement. There just provide additional explanation and analysis of items in the financial statement. So again, just if you, there's a nice note in there about the budget cycle and the requirements of the budget, how the budget cycle work, and the, the time back, timing of that. Uh, the summary and definite the only thing you have outstanding is at least purchase payable, and it talks in there, and it shows the maturity of that. Uh, and again, that's almost paid off. It'll be paid off in three more years unless you enter. That's the buses and that. And it's listed on the top of page <coughs> nine. That's the building improvement and then the blooper bus. I don't know if you've done anything. Have you done anything new in this year? No. Okay. We ordered a bus, but okay. Lord knows when it's coming. <laughs> when, when, <laughs> yeah, that's the way these buses are these nowadays. You kind of order it in hope. Yeah. San Francisco. If you look on pay on the page before that on those three, where does this main print is where most of the violations? Remember that you're your financial statements. If we're not aware of any either. If we were aware of any, we'd require that you report it. You know. Uh, so again, that's why it's worded the way it is. It talks from it about the exception to the cash base. Yes, it would be in federal fund. That it is not in, uh, that it is not in the temperature of violation. Does anybody have any questions on that?
Note 10 talks about the defined benefit pension plan on page 12. Starts on page 12. That's a pretty nice description of capers. Uh, again, remember it's a it's a it's a brief synopsis of the contributions and stuff how that works. Uh, one thing to note where it talks about the net pension liability, I think that's on page 13. Uh, let me look. On page 12, it talks about the cycle and uh, kind of describes the capers. Yeah, the top of page 13 talks about the net pension liability. Remember that's the district share that is attributable to the employees of the district for the employer share of the capers requirement. But that's under current law and under that's covered by the state for school districts. So that's a commitment of the state. We're not required to report it in the financial statements, but we are required to disclose it. And that's all that is. It talks in there about it not being part of the financial statements. Uh, does anybody have any questions on it? You can see the state is behind a little bit, but they are catching up. Okay? And hopefully sometime in, in the future I'll be able to say, probably that will never be zero. Probably that will never be zero because you're always adding to it for the current employees. This is based on, you know, when they retire, what their amount you want, their, the, would be owed on, on your behalf of your employees. Does anybody have any questions on that? Talks in there about the lease with the rent commission on the building. I think everybody's familiar with that. That happened a couple of years ago that were required, I think, in the notes to, to further explain that. That's the, the top of page. Since Josh has fallen, I'll try to help him out. Yeah, top of page 14 talks about police with the right commission. On page 15 and 16, just complies with the budget law. Basically, remember when you adopt your budget, you do two things. You adopt the mill rate necessary to fund the next year's budget. So here we're talking about 21-22 budget, and, you know, that you adopted in August. This is the year before. And you're also, you also set the legal maximum expenditures, if you read that top part of it, it talks about it. As far as the state's concerned, it's just the total amount expended for each fund in total, not line items, as we're going to see here in a little bit. So the line items don't matter as long as you're under, under on one of the, the amount that you're up on. I, I got a question for Josh. Um, is the special education fund, is that the total dollars going to crack? Well, no. <clears throat> no. That, would, that would include the flow through. That would include the, the amount that Pratt gets on your behalf. Okay, so some of that is, yeah. <clears throat> not just the exception. When we get to that line, I want, I want you to stop and tell us. Okay, okay. Yeah. if you look on page, oh, let me find it. Page 31 of that total 618, 230 is assessment, 370 is closure. That's money that the state gives you that basically is the co op. So you pass it on to the co op. So how much? I missed it. Uh, 240 is the assessment. Here, this was last year's 209 and 230, and 386 and 370 was the closure. Page 30. Page third right. 31. We're looking at page thirty-one right. Yeah. So the assessment is the dollars that we pay from our general fund right to right. the co-op. The flow through is money that comes from the state to us. We give it to them. Right. It has to. It's shown in the general fund as okay. special ed state aid, and then it's transferred to the special ed fund and paid to the co-op. And then the rest of this we pay for transportation, but the state reimburses us eighty percent for that. Right. Which, if the state was fully funding special ed like they're supposed to, that 240 would stay in our budget. Would that be correct? Um, not really. Okay. It would, indirectly, yes. 
um, you know, it costs X number of dollars to operate the co-op. Mm -hmm. They're not getting what they need from the state. So to fund it. So they, they have, have to they assess the district. Our assessment would be less. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Right. Probably, again, we, we look at that percentage that, like Josh said, it probably wouldn't totally alleviate your right. assessment, but it would reduce it somehow. Yeah. The flow through money is, again, it's money from the state that didn't affect you. If you look uh, on the general fund, you'll see a line called special ed. Uh, let me find that page number real quick. If we look on page 17, special education aid, that's money that the state gives you. It then is transferred to the special education fund that you turn around and give to the co-op. In the old days, you know, for us old timers, that used to be paid directly to the co-op. And then, but, you know, because of transparency and, and whatnot, they thought it was better if it, it showed how much was actually the state paid on behalf of the district for that. Because for that. you're benefiting from that, supposedly, from that. Mm -hmm. from that. You say transparency, I say they inflate our budget. Right, right, it inflates your budget. Right. Good questions. Hopefully I answered them. Or with Josh, he probably answered them. But that's a good question. That includes the flow through. So again, that special education budget is high because of the flow through. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If we skip on back, the next 30, 40 pages is take kind of like what we do there. If you have a question about any individual funds, you can look at the individual funds page and see what the prior year expenditures were, uh, the prior year line item was, uh, the receipts, expenditures, cash balance. Just keep in mind that, that it, it compares it to budget. When you budget that line item, all that all the, the state's concerned about is the total for each fund. That's why that, that summary fund is more important. Because uh, that follows this Kansas statutes. Okay? Page 46 starts the agency fund. 46, 47, 48. They got the activity funds of the district. The only reason I point those out is to say that as part of our audit, we do audit those, and they are covered under our audit report. So, uh, again, those are all covered. Like, or to the graphs, which basically just show the five-year history or trends of the history. You know, capital outlay obviously has increased. You know, we, we talked, we saw how your cash has increased. You can see right here where those funds are. They increase special aid increased a little bit. Capital outlay increases significant amount between the years. Everything else stayed about the same. Josh and Lisa at the end of each year always do, and Marla do the year end transfers to replenish the cash balances and put the money back in the funds as they see fit. And that will benefit the district in the most. I think you all adopted uh, as part of the minutes and motion that basically approves them to do, make those transfers. They do a good job of making those transfers. Does anybody have any questions on that? If we look on page 54 to say, hey, you'll notice it didn't change very much. The next chief has to show the bar and the general and supplemental general fund revenue just for those two funds. The bulk of the, obviously, their revenue comes from the state. Uh, and there's your state aid. You can see it has gradually gone up, but it hasn't changed much. The big increase, as you'll see here in a little bit, is on page 50. The next page, 55, shows the general and if we go by function. And again, when we're talking, remember when we're talking about spending limits, is here we're talking about both purchases of uh, goods and services and also transfers. 
uh, yeah, you're not ta you're not talking about going out and buying something necessarily. You're talking about transferring to these other funds for future year future budgets. Okay, and you can see the bulk of the increase just the past year was in the transfers on the uh, And again, that's a true for what if your enrollment is staying the same, then the but base state aid for people is increasing under the new school finance rule. The next two graphs just show that as a percentage that same information. Now remember, like I always tell districts, this is just the general simple now. So if you want the total instructional expenditures, you have to look at those transfers and realize that the bulk of those transfers go to the special revenue funds that are heavily instructional. If we look at your budget, I always look at that budget for pupil. And if we look at that, for this last year, for 21-22, your, your instructional expenditures for all funds is, was 65% and your report was 67. So the state usually recommends you try to keep that between 60 and 65%. Now, again, your instructional expenditures are significantly lower than that, but that's because, again, that's just general self and this is all, this includes the at risk, the special education, like we talked about, which are heavily instructional. Does anybody have any questions on that? Josh, you want to add anything on that? Nope. Okay. The next, like the, the, the page that shows the lines, that's what I was talking about. A good chunk of that, that's it. On page, page 60, let's, let's talk real quick about 60. That yeah, shows the increase in federal assistance, which again, I would expect that to be comfortable. You won't have to put sparks money next year, you know, barring unforeseen, you know, any, anything happening there that you'll have to ask for money which is federal assistance. And you've already talked a little bit about the extra funds. So, again, when, once, you know, you want it to, the federal money is going to stay with us probably for two or three years to be, to spend all the gas or three funds, which I think those have to be spent by 2014. Oh, 24. Or 24, uh, I mean, yeah, 2024. So you've got a number of years yet. I don't know what, 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 what time frame you're operating on. Yeah. You have to get permission yeah. from the state. <laughs> yeah. And you have to get allowable expenditures that you can use for that. And so much of the extra three has to be used for lost learning expenditures, which I don't know how you define that. Have you? No. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think the state is really, I think they get different kinds from the feds, what is considered lost, learning loss. So that'll be a challenge, I think, moving forward. Obviously, if you're adding programs, but if you've got existing programs that you're going Enhance, you know, proving to them that it's for learning losses may be a challenge. Okay, does anybody have any questions on that? The next couple graphs, page 61, talk about the valuation. It dropped a little bit from 38 to 35. I don't know what your, that was last year's valuation. And then if we look at your enrollment, your mill rate stayed about pretty flat. Yeah. You know, increased a little bit. But again, I think they do a good job of watching that, monitoring that, and making sure that that does try not to increase that many more than you have to. Your enrollment, you can see on that how that's relatively stayed the same. Again, the nice thing about 
Staying the same is you get that higher base data aid per pupil that we didn't used to get. That's been increasing the last couple of years. So that's nice. Even though the enrollment stays the same, it gives you a little bit more time to go to use for you know either general fund or transferring at the end of the year like you're able to do. Does anybody have any questions on that? Okay, the two re other reports that we've got there, I think they're effective inside. They're identical to last year with the exception of changing the, the date. One of them is called, the, the single page is the internal control report, it's definitely the only thing that's dead and all. We're just required to report. Yeah. Primarily it's the segregation of the, due to the small size of the school district. Again, that's nobody's fault. That's just the nature of the and Does anybody have any questions on that? That I think been there for years and years and years. So we've been uh, basically, we just re recommend that you continue to do what you do, review the report, review the bills, and approve them each or if you like to do. Mm -hmm. The two page report, uh, the one that's stable, deals with uh, That is called the letter of the Charter for Governance, which is obviously the Board of Education. We're required to report in there if we encounter any difficulties during the audit, or if there's a disagreement between us and management, which management basically consists, consists of Josh and Alyssa. If we have a disagreement in Barlow over how something should be recorded, we never have. Never have. So that's good. But we're required to put that in there. We put in there that there were no disagreements and noted. If, again, we have difficulty doing the other word, we're, we're, we are required to report that in there. Two, again, we didn't have any difficulty. We appreciate uh, being of service and uh, hospitality. The, they afforded us the couple days we were out here. We know it, it's a little disruptive, but uh, it's part of the job. It's part of the job. We appreciate you guys more you guys. Usually, when you hear audit, you know you think of, of mean guys. We try not to be too mean. <laughs> try not to be. I said. I don't think you've ever been mean. Okay, good, 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 good. Does anybody have any questions? That was kind of a whirlwind. If you have any questions over the report, feel free to talk to Josh or you can give me a call. But don't, like I always tell people, before they give me a call, be prepared to just talk for a lot because I can, can talk as long as you want me to, probably longer than you want me to in most cases. Again, we appreciate being of service. We thank you for your business. And thank you. Okay. Uh, we can continue to relate. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. I need more time. Thanks a lot. Got a number one. Got a motion there. Uh, I'll go ahead and once it's approved, assuming it's approved, I'll file it with the state electronically. Like That's a good one. I'll probably email Larissa and you with a copy of the report. Okay. And, or Aaron will. Right. I'll let you know that it's finished. There's a hundred dollar five database. Same slash. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Mr. Mm -hmm. President, the board approved the 2021 audit report. Second. It's been moved and seconded mm -hmm. that the board approve the 2020 through 21 audit report as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 I was going to tell you, thanks for sliding me in when I got here. No, no problem. <laughs> so, I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> thanks a lot. Have a good rest of the meeting. Thanks, thanks Mark. Thank you, Mark. Okay, senior work release. A couple of kids yeah. requesting to have a shortened schedule. I have two students requesting shortened schedule. Uh, Michaela Meyer and Nevaeh Fisher. Um, Michaela has a job at uh, Golden Bell Peters, and it kind of fits in with her 
career. She's looking at agricultural stuff as far as her career goes. Uh, she's been working out there for quite a while. Right now she's working in the in the red building where they sell meat on the highway, I think. Uh, and then Nevada Fisher uh, working at White's. Um, her plans after school were to go to the military. And she's already set up with the recruiter and everything, so what she needs for that really is just to make sure she graduates. Reviewed both their records um, easily within that. Um, they should, as long as they continue to do what they're doing, have those credits to graduate. So I recommend that we approve those. Mr. President, I move the board approve the list of students for senior early release. Right. Been moved and seconded that the board approve the list of students for senior early release. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Daycare. Uh, so, so I'm going to backtrack on this. This one's not going to be an action item tonight. Um, uh, Phil Martin, our board attorney, is working on, uh, he's got the paperwork pretty much done, uh, but we need to get a, an appraisal of the building. Um, um, and I told Chad at the bank that the <coughs> district would cover that cost since they're donating the building and uh, we have to get a title commitment report and title insurance and then we'll move to close but that'll take a little bit of time so one of the steps in the process would be approving this confirmation and acknowledgement of the receipt of the gift we should probably wait till we've actually received it before we <laughs> approve the receipt of the gift so uh, I had this in here just because I wasn't sure if if, the, if SJ and Bank, they were wanting to get that done before the end of the year, but uh, Chad said, no, there's no hurry. So uh, on another note, our attorney is retiring at the end of the year, at the end of the calendar year, so in a couple of weeks. So we, uh, we've got KASD to fall back on, but we'll need to, uh, there's enough things like this that we go through that KASB does not do, so having a board appointed attorney locally I think is a positive thing. A lot of districts just appoint KASB, but um, uh, so he should have everything ready for us and we'll probably have to close after he's retired and everything, but he's willing to stick it out, finalize this deal. So really we should be able to take ownership of that building for the cost of an appraisal and uh, title insurance. <coughs> Uh, that'll be on the on next month's meeting or an upcoming meeting. Okay. Thank you. Football concession building. Uh, as you know, we've got uh, a donation from uh, Marion and Juanita Alpers on the restroom facility and concession facility. Um, their interest was making it more uh, better accessible for elderly or uh, handicapped individuals the bathrooms are not a good situation um, the trick there is well, what do we do there's not a lot of room to expand <coughs> to the west um, we need to be able to get in and out of there with a the vehicle um, you know fix up those restrooms um, it's a cinder block building um, it's in decent shape it's not great um, so the options are, do we try to find some way to add on to the building, uh, remodel it in some way, um, or clear it, clear it out and rebuild there, or build something at a different site. Um, ideally, in a perfect world, it would be nice to have a facility that has locker rooms and restrooms and concessions, but that's uh, that's pie in the sky stuff. I, I don't see a way to afford that, but um, as far as fundraising efforts, I kind of need some input on what this board would like to see done with that building. How long is that building been here? I don't know. I mean, I can't say it's been a long time it's inside here, is it? It's a building ran down besides the bathrooms? Part of it. it needs a good remodel. It needs a good gut job for sure. It's kind of gross in there and it's all cinder block, isn't it? Yeah, cinder block and concrete pad. Yeah. Got to be either clear, cleared off, in my opinion. Yeah. 
starts and start new. To, that's when you're implementing everything. I, I don't have an idea on cost. If we tried to gut the thing and redo it and make it nicer and redo the bathrooms, are, are you going to be the same cost as if you just raised the thing and rebuild? Can we take Smith further to the east if you did if we get rid of the building further? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you could feasibly put in a 30 by 60 here. The existing building is about 20 by 40. So give you an idea how how much room there is. You, know, you can't get too close to the pit there. You're kind of boxed in there, but there is some room. Or I can come up with options. I can get a contractor in and get a ballpark idea of what's it going to cost. To... I'd like to think bigger picture of maybe purchasing some land next door to the north. Okay. Putting in some parking. Right. And concessions and locker room. So, see if it's possible. Right. My family has sold some land recently. And Maybe you could raise some money to secure, right. secure a little bit of it. So I think parking is an issue. It is. Other thoughts on that? Are the interior interior partition walls cinder block too? Yes. Okay. It's all cinder block. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure. So not a whole lot it of options for the Yeah. yeah. I think you have the concession separated by to the storage area, and yeah. I think it's cinder block wall and cinder block wall, and then between the bathrooms and so. On. Okay. Just difficult to do any plumbing or electrical or anything in there. I'm in favor of looking at a different building. Okay. Well, we'll get to work on maybe coming up with some potential options there and how much money we might have to raise. Okay. Is, is, is the city owned the ballpark? The city owns all of that. The city owns the. Um, the football field and everything. We lease it from them for nothing. Okay. So um, maybe going in with the city to to get some land up there north, like Nance mentioned, but then also make it more accessible for the baseball field, and perhaps we can get back to to having uh, baseball as a sport. Or have a locker room, or getting tournaments, or whatever like they used to do. Right. <laughs> Back when I was uh, young, right. in the Stone Ages, um, and maybe um, getting them involved in would would help with maybe some funding. Sure. Or citywide um, fundraiser or sponsorship or something. There also is, I mean, now that Vance brought that up with the additional land, having your uh, discus areas are not ideal. If you've ever been to a track meet, it's head on a swivel when you're walking around there. Uh, uh, so having some more area up there would be a better situation. Parking is definitely needed. <clears throat> you got some more land to the north, you could you could move your shop put and everything up and bring your concession stand closer to the stage where the probably would have to walk by as far. Yeah. You know, just put it right in there somewhere. Yeah. Good point. Well, thank you guys for making this more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a good idea. Yeah. All right. Uh, board member activities. Uh, 
celebration was top-notch and uh, uh, like Josh said in the notes uh, it's a great learning experience for the kids and it's it's humbling for me personally but great job great job I did hear one student thank the guy for uh, ending slavery <laughs> <laughs> Off a few wars <laughs> Debbie. <laughs> okay. We have had a very <laughs> busy month. Um, we just hired a new director, uh, Dr. Bob Dickenbrock, uh, handed in his resignation. As of June 30th, we hired, we interviewed uh, a couple candidates and hired somebody. <laughs> it will be Megan. Megan Etheridge, she's currently an assistant director there, and we're looking at um, uh, reorganizing the administrative office, the director and the assistant director positions to cover um, finances more ac uh, accurately or to make it less burdensome for just one person. Um, we also had a considerable discussion the last two meetings about the use of ESSER funds for um, retention bonuses, or we're not supposed to call them um, um, Oh, what's the word I want? Uh, well, we're not supposed to call them bonuses. Uh, for the teachers. So all of the three schools in the district have given some sort of uh, um, funds to their teachers, to the special ed teachers and parents in their schools <laughs> who were full-time, but there were three schools that did not. One of them, because they earmarked all of that funding for a complete new HVAC system, um, and the, the special ed folks were aware of that in the beginning um, and were fine with it, but the others came to um, the co-op and then asked if the co-op then would use some of the, their ESSER funds to um, give those same kind of retention funds back to the teachers and the districts that did not determine, um, did not include them in any kind of, um, oh, I'm gonna just say bonuses because that's, that's basically what it was. <laughs> there was a lot of discussion on that. I know that there are some schools that didn't think it was fair that we used our ESSER funds and included the special ed folks um, when all of our staff Five hundred dollars. There was another school that gave everyone a thousand dollars, and there were a couple of schools that gave two fifty, but it came out of their master funds. So then, to have three schools ask that the money from um, the special ed co-op go for those people who um, didn't set well with with some of the schools. And then the third thing we're looking at. Um, There are a couple of schools that would like to see us reorganize the co-op and have the individual schools responsible for hiring uh, the SPED teachers and the parents and including them in our staff and then just having um, uh, um, the itinerants out of Pratt, which would And it would decrease the amount of assessments that we did, but it would increase the amount of work in trying to uh, find and fill and train those positions. So those are the three things we're working on right now. 
Okay. Thank you, Debbie. Administrative reports. I feel like my time should already be up. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we've been going over district-wide here in the last year and a half or so uh, is looking at our students and evaluating our students and the teachers do this kind of to determine which of our students are higher risk. And we have a set of criteria that we use in a couple of scales, but I've uh, been working on that. <clears throat> and uh, looking at that data, and right now we're starting to uh, work the staff starting to look at strategies to help identify um, those students and, and figure out how we can how we can close that gap with them. So, um, you know, over the past year, two years almost now, year and a half, um, we've we've had a lot of issues with uh, social emotional decline. I think or str struggles, social emotional struggles. So I think this looking at this data and analyzing the risks and really trying to focus on some of the kids that we identify as higher risk is going to help us in that regard. And it's also part of our, our KISA process. I, I did, uh, I had it on my report also but while we're here. I'll just pull it up here. So what we're, we look at is attendance, behavior, and course performance, and social emotional. So ABCs. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll be a little <laughs> So, Attendance, behavior, and course performance is kind of an early warning indicator of if students are struggling in one of those three areas, uh, one or more, um, or really any four, one of those four areas, um, they're less likely to graduate. So if we can identify those kids, um, at least by sixth grade, the ones that are struggling, either just getting to school or with their uh, their interpersonal relationships or their course performance or their behavior, if we can intervene early, uh, we'll see benefits down the road. So if you see our uh, uh, elementary attendance, you know, we've got about 4% at the high risk, behavior about 4%, uh, course performance about 11 social emotional about the same. Their secondary, uh, 10% on attendance, about the same on behavior, 17 on course performance, and a little higher on social emotional. Um, some of that social emotional data that we're getting is not, it is not, yeah, not, it's kind of skewed to the high end of identifying more kids high risk. Um, uh, so we work through that, but. Uh, but the, you know, Kind of what we're going to do at the secondary level is we're going to identify staff that students have a good relationship with now, you know, and so those staff members can can work with those students. And I've, I've asked all of the students which staff members in our school, and it can be teachers or bus drivers or custodians or whatever, who do you trust if you have an issue? Who do you want to talk to if, if you're having problems? And so, by doing that, we can kind of pair those students up with a staff member that they trust, rather than me just pulling them in my office or Mrs. Hacker or whatever, um, so that we try and build those relationships and identify those, those causes for some of those high-risk factors and help bring those down through building relationships. And I also have a handful of kids who said, I, I don't have an adult in the building that's, that I feel that comfortable with. So, Part of what we'll do is figure out how we can make those connections. So hopefully through that process, uh, we can really uh, bring those risk scales down. And like Mr. Meyer said, if it, uh, you know, if we identify those in the elementary and we start doing that as as we move into high school, um, we should be able to take all of those, all or a good portion of those risks, those students at risk, and reduce that. And, and have a much better learning environment and be able to target their learning needs and instead of spending as much time on, on the social-emotional side of things. But <clears throat> certainly working on that, that's, that's definitely a need. Um, one of the things that I think I'm pretty proud of, of a lot of our teachers this year, um, we've done a lot with school community uh, collaboration and education. And part of that, to be quite honest, uh, bringing 
Natalie Clark on. She has a she's done a lot of things with her classes that uh, have gotten out into the community and used our community resources. Um, Mrs. Mixon, with some of her uh, classes, have done some community resources. We went, you know, just taking her business uh, class that she had or her uh, technology class down to the down to the. Uh, EcoDevo workspace that they have to kind of explain how you can start a business through that if you wanted to, having guest speakers come in, really trying to focus a lot more on that community collaboration <clears throat> because that's an important piece of, a, of us being successful is the community being in and our kids having buy into the community both. Along with that, this spring we'll be hosting a uh, career fair where uh, our students will get a chance to talk to people from our community who have businesses and kind of find out what different careers are available in our communities. And the hope is we help them uh, identify career interests and possibly um, identify needs for what we have in our community so some of those students come back. So those will be, you know, that career fair will be a big piece of what, uh, what we look at this spring. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. The school projects that we've been on, um, you guys, I think maybe you toured the greenhouse. I don't know if it was done at the time. We have the greenhouse finished. Um, seeing the pictures there, Mr. Delph has uh, set up already. We have some seedlings started. The, the tilapia tank is there running. We have our fish in it right now. And his class is going to build a uh, tiered um, growing uh, apparatus above that tank <clears throat> so there'll be plenty of room for other um, classes and that'll be a good learning space for a lot of grade levels and stuff. Um, so looking forward to that and seeing other curriculum areas get involved in that in the greenhouse projects. Residential carpentry, um, going to town on that house, you know the, the demo on it took almost all last year they're putting some walls up, they're putting some sheetrock up, getting things, uh, getting insulation in. So things are starting to move a little bit uh, faster on that. We're a semester in, and Mr. Mr. Moritz, when he started that, had a, a goal of trying to be done a lot sooner than what he's going to get done. But Mr. Meyer and I tried to tell him that he was being a little too ambitious. Cause not only are they doing the work, but he's taking the time to teach the kids how to do the wiring and stuff like that. So I think it's coming along pretty well. Um, you can really start to, start to see it take shape with the walls being gone and new walls being put up and concrete poured back in where the bathroom is going to be. And, uh, you can really see those things start to start to shape up. The two, uh, the two egress windows we put in the basement have totally changed the, the look of that um, basement, made it look more like a house down there. <clears throat> um, our business and fax department right now are working together to start a kind of a school store, which would be a coffee shop. During the summer, Ms. Patterson went and uh, got certified to be a barista. And um, so they're looking at starting a coffee shop, business class, um, business essentials class we kind of run the business side of it. Uh, Mrs. Patterson's class, uh, her baking uh, baking and pastries class, making little snacks and stuff, uh, and serving coffee to kids and, and uh, staff. Right now, Mrs. Patterson's baking and pastries class is doing something just about every Friday and selling snacks to kids during RLS time. <coughs> Excuse me. And some of those, she's used the the proceeds like to donate to the junior class for prom and things like that. So um, anyway, uh, good some good stuff going there. The kids are getting some good practical experience. In. Got our concert this Thursday. We, it will be in the auditorium uh, as of now. Um, unless we have something unforeseen, it will be in the auditorium. So I'd love to see you there. Uh, I have a part in it. It's a non-singing part. So, don't have to worry too much about that. Our uh, winter, Keisha has the winter moratorium from the 23rd to the 27th, so there won't be any team practices from the 23rd to the 27th of December. Gives families a chance to get out and uh, 
coaches a chance to not feel like they're pressured to have to coach every day of the break and stuff. So anyway, um, got that coming up. Midwinter Classic is here a lot quicker than you would think it would be. Um, coming up middle of January. We have eight boys teams, so we have a full bracket for the boys. We have five girls teams that will play the whole tournament. And because with, with a five-team bracket, you can't get every team three games, uh, we invited Reno County Homeschool, who has been here before, but they didn't want to come to the tournament this year. We invited them. They will play one game on Saturday so that every girls team will get the full three games of a tournament. Might not have a clear-cut tournament champion. <laughs> it's kind of complicated with just five teams. Five teams is difficult. We do have uh, Minneapolis signed up for next year. Not for this year, but for next year. Boys and girls both will come and we'll, uh, one of those, <coughs> One of those private schools that come to the tournament will probably not be here the following year to, to make room for them to bring both. So, um, Midwinter Classic coming up. It's going to be a huge week. We're going to have four games on one of the nights, three games on the rest of the weeknights except Wednesday. And we'll start at 10.30 on Saturday and be done at about 10, <laughs> 9 or 10 at night. Um, we'll have seven games on that Saturday. The other teams that bring just their boys, how close are they on contracts so we can try and get both teams here? Um, I'm going to, Mr. Nelson's been contacting them, and I don't know what the contract status is on those for sure, but um, Mr. Nelson's doing a pretty good job of, of working on that, trying to get it to where we have um, boy and girl both. What boys do we have this year? Um, I'd love to name them for you. <laughs> Us, Maxville, um, Nickerson, Lauren, and then Nickerson, Nickerson uh, CP, Sunrise, Sunrise, Independent, and Reno County, and Reno County. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we get this thing up to where it's eight boys teams and eight girls teams, it's going to be a week of crazy for everybody. We're going to need all of you guys to volunteer, <laughs> <laughs> which we may need. We're, we're going to need some of that this year anyway, but it's really good for our school to have it. Uh, it's good for our town for us to bring that many people in, especially on Saturday when, uh, you know, at some time on Saturday, all 14 of those teams will be playing. So, all right. Any questions? Other questions? All right. Thank you. Uh, we already talked about that ABC's data. I don't really have a COVID update for you. Numbers are really low right now. We're in pretty good shape. Um, and I appreciate uh, this board's support on all, all of those things. You know, we don't, uh, our school is not an echo chamber where we just, uh, it's ideology of don't do anything or do everything. It's, we got to live day to day with this mess. And uh, uh, it's not easy. Uh, yeah, I know. There's a lot of competing interest there, but we're doing our best. Uh, preschool funding, um, they added three-year-old at risk to our funding this year, so we should get a little more funding than I wasn't planning on. That's always a, a nice uh, positive. But we've got kind of a mess of funding. So we hire one teacher, the co-op hires another teacher, and they get funding for uh, our teacher, and we get funding for their teacher, and it's just a convoluted mess and how it has to work. And I wish the state would just say, here's X number of dollars per kid for preschool, educate them. But we're jumping through hoops with a, a state grant through the co-op and then our at-risk funding or special ed funding, but we're making it work and it's a better situation now than it or will be next year um, than it has been. So I think we've got a pretty good system. Uh, we went through our safe defense system, did a test run, here when we had the kids out of the building, uh, had our sheriff and police chief here uh, to see the system go. Um, uh, worked well, got a couple of bugs to work out, a couple of people didn't get a, a message. Um, the timing on that, I got the message within five seconds of the system being activated. Uh, Blaine was probably closer to a minute and a half. Maybe Tori was two minutes. Uh, we had the dispatch, got the call and got the radio call 
two minutes and 15 seconds probably. Uh, so very quick notification, but uh, every police officer would have that message inside of two minutes when it's activated. Um, everybody in the building would hear that and check their email, check their message and know where the threat is. So we're in good shape there. Did have a test run on that. Board president and vice president, we redo that in January. Um, with the changeover, you know, we're not having any turnover here, but uh, 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 it's really the new year for boards of education. So we will have that president and vice president. So think about that if you want to still have your duties or if you want to have an overthrow. Uh, uh, board meeting dates is the other thing we need to uh, set technically. Um, it's kind of silly to set, a, set it in January, in my opinion, when we've already got a calendar set. So we already established the dates, we just have to reaffirm them. Um, food service budget balance, um, I did include some information here for you. Um, I won't go through all of this, but I've kind of laid out. Um, I just do this every year after we get our audit in our uh, revenue and our expenses and uh, uh, where we're at, so essentially it costs us less than $100 a day to run our kitchen. So anytime those budget issues come up that, well, we could not have school, you know, we could take a fewer days of school and we'd save on food service. It's that well, it only costs us $68 a day to operate that because of the revenue we get. So uh, things like that don't make a whole lot of sense. But um, anyway, last year it cost us about $11,000. Um, and that's because we we spent more on equipment. Uh, that's one thing that's, that, that doesn't show up here. That's not just food purchases and salary costs. It's we do purchase some equipment periodically. Um, the other thing is our drug dog. We've got, uh, I've been working with Providence to get a contract for them to come out. I was hoping they'd get out here before Christmas, but that's not going to happen. So still working with them to get something going for the remainder of this year. And, uh, continue that relationship. So, that's all I had on my report. All right. Hey, executive session. Uh, I don't have any executive session items. I'll tell you what I have for personnel. Uh, one is my contract for approval and the other one is a resignation from our fax teacher. If we need to discuss those. We can go into executive session or if anybody else had anything else. Otherwise, we can just okay. move to the contract. All right. Resignations and contracts. Um, you have a copy of my contract on your machine. She didn't want to discuss your contract. Oh, yeah, she's here. Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> I thought okay. we lost you. You disappeared. Oh, I just turned off the side. Yeah. I That's all right. That's all right. I just... You didn't have to look at me. <laughs> so, okay. Didn't you include that in our packet? I, I don't remember. I think so. Okay. I, I, I did last it. month. It's the same as last month. Okay. Okay, do we have a motion regarding Josh's contract? I move we approve the contract for Mr. Meyer as um, um, shown in the supporting documents. Right. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we renew the contract as in our documents. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. And then I have a resignation from uh, Mrs. Patterson. Um, so this is her 10th year at um, St. John High School. She wants to move on to bigger and better things in retirement. So I would recommend uh, approving her resignation. Appreciate her service to the district over the last 10 years. So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we accept the resignation of Mrs. Patterson. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. 
I feel the same sign. Motion carried. All right, future agenda items. You got a list there? Okay. I'd like to make sure we continue to, and we do all the time anyway with the COVID, what we're dealing with, but it sure needs to be, I think we did a wise decision tonight, but I think also we need to have that in our agenda as far as what we can continue to keep doing. Okay. Get back to normal. Okay. So to speak. Duly noted. Okay. Second. It's been moved and seconded. We adjourned. All those in favor? Well, uh, from what I heard, I might have missed something. Uh, what? All in favor, say aye. 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 Both same side. Those in favor.